Night had fallen, and the air was cool. A few birds continued to sing from their nests in the tall pines along the roadside. Wendy's footsteps were loud in her ears as she walked. The road was unfamiliar to her, as was the neighborhood itself. Her new apartment was two miles back the way she had come, and she still had another mile to go before she reached her turnaround point. She kept a steady pace, her fanny pack bouncing rhythmically against her behind. The occasional car raced past, some of them moving away from the shoulder of the road, and others staying close. Wendy's reflective safety vest and blinking lights seemed only to alert the drivers who were actually paying attention to the road. It was a roll of the dice whether or not she would be hit every time a car came by. But she didn't mind. The weather was pleasant, and it was good to get outside, away from her computer in constant research. She began whistling to herself as she approached the closed-off road to an old campground. A rusting chain stretched across the cracked pavement of the entrance and was looped around two pine trees. From the chain's sagging center, a faded sign reading, No Trespassing, hung limply. There was no breeze to move it. As Wendy drew closer, she heard a curious sound. Almost as though someone, or something, was shuffling towards her. When she reached the entrance, she paused and looked down the dark road. The alternating flash of red and white from her safety light illuminated the trees in a harsh way, giving the tree-lined passage a nightmarish quality. And Wendy saw movement, a large, hunched-over shape. It took her a moment to realize it was a person, one dressed in rags and with a backpack on. The stranger shuffled towards her, caught sight of the light and lifted its head up. From the depths of the hood, long stringy white hair fell down, framing a face etched with age and sorrow. The stranger was a woman, and she looked as though she could be anywhere between thirty and fifty years old. Her gnarled fingers were hooked into the straps of the backpack, and she continued to approach the chain across the entrance with careful measured steps. Her feet were hidden by the long, ragged skirt she wore, its color long since faded to a neutral, dirty beige. She smiled at Wendy, and Wendy smiled back. Can you spare some change? The woman asked, coming to a stop a few feet on the other side of the slim barrier. I want to go up to the convenience store and get something to eat. Maybe a pack of cigarettes. Hey, have you got a cigarette on you? No, Wendy said. I'm sorry, I don't. I might have some change, though. Really? She said, taking a step closer. She straightened up slightly. Sure would be nice of you. Tough times? Wendy asked. She opened her safety vest, unzipped her hoodie, and reached into the pocket of her shirt. Terrible, the woman said softly. Her voice seemed suddenly soothing, and she licked her lips. She seemed taller. She eased herself closer. Are you going to Cumberland Farms gas station? Wendy asked conversationally. Yes, she murmured. She reached the gate and her hands extended from the ends of her sleeves. The fingers, Wendy noticed, were exceptionally thin, the forefingers longer than the middles, and each finger was tipped with a long, dull gray nail, the edges of which looked wickedly sharp. Wendy smiled at her, pulled her money out of her shirt pocket and showed it to the woman. Thank you, the old woman whispered, her eyes locking on to Wendy. They were large and pale, lighter than the moon. Wendy looked away with some difficulty and focused on her money. She unfolded the bills, revealed a small, clear plastic bag, turned it upside down, emptying the contents onto the ground. Thousands and thousands of grains of iodized salt fell to the cracked pavement. The woman's eyes widened, and she let out a shriek of dismay. She dropped to the road, her knees striking the pavement loudly, and she began to count the individual grains. 
Why? She asked with a moan. Why? Why? What's your name? Wendy asked. The woman didn't answer. She remained focused on the salt. What is your name? Wendy demanded. The woman snarled, looked up and spat. Mary! Mary, Wendy said, nodding. Nice name. Mine's Wendy. Mary ignored her, carefully making a pile of the grains she had already counted. It was an exceptionally small pile. While she focused on her task, Wendy reached back into her sweatshirt and freed her pistol. It was a small 9mm automatic. Wendy whistled to herself, brought her fanny pack around to the front, and she opened it. From its overstuffed depths, she removed a suppressor. With long practiced motions, she screwed the suppressor into the barrel of the automatic and chambered around. Mary glanced up at Wendy and snarled. Bullets won't work! I know, werewolf! I'll shred your flesh before I'm through with you! Yes, Wendy said. I'm sure you'd like to. She took careful aim at Mary's right knee and fired. The pistol gave a small bark in the right knee, the entire joint, vanished. The specially cast gold hollow-tipped round destroyed it. Mary let out a shriek of rage, yet she continued to count. She couldn't stop herself. Wendy stepped over the chain and kicked the severed lower leg away. A foul, stinking black ichor leaked from the wound, but nothing more. It's been a while since you've eaten, Wendy said, walking around to the other side of her. Guess the jogger who disappeared last month was your last meal? Shut up! Mary snapped as she continued to count. Wendy shrugged, lined up a shot on Mary's left knee and pulled the trigger. <laughs> Mary let out a torrent of angry words, which sounded vaguely Gaelic, but she still couldn't turn away from the salt. Cautiously, Wendy kicked the left leg away, glanced at the salt pile, which was diminishing rapidly, and she brought her pistol up again. Her heart fluttered. She had come to the most dangerous part of the task. A shot to the throat, and even the banshee's compulsive need to count would be overridden by the desire to survive. Mary might not attack her, but the creature could certainly slip away into the darkness. Severing the arms would also free Mary of the compulsion to count, and depending on how strong she was, she might even be able to attack Wendy without her limbs. But she hadn't been hunting Bavan Sit Banshees for thirty years to give up or shrink away. The explosive tipped rounds in the pistol gave her an edge, as did her skill with the weapon. So Wendy took the same chance she always did. She could only hope she was faster than Mary's instinct to survive. Wendy was. Four quick shots separated Mary's arms at the elbows and nearly severed her neck. Mary fell back her mouth working frantically in silent rage. A single artery kept her head attached to her body, and this, Wendy shot as well. Quickly, she took a plastic bag from her pack, shook it open, and grabbed the banshee's head by the hair. The hate in Mary's eyes was powerful, and Wendy smiled at her as she dropped the head into the bag. She tied it off, set it down on the pavement, and went about the dirty process of dragging the various parts of Mary's body down the driveway. She came to a worn and battered log cabin labeled Office in faded yellow letters. Wendy dropped Mary's forearms onto the ground and returned for the Banshee's legs. When those had joined the arms, Wendy went back for the torso. By the time she had gotten it to the others, she was sweating and shaking her head at the stink coming off her clothes. Finally, Wendy went back for Mary's head. She could see the Banshee's lips working beneath the plastic. With a sigh, Wendy picked up the bag by its knot and kept it at arm's length. <sighs> she didn't need Mary to bite through the bag. And that's how hunters die, Wendy thought. One moment of forgetfulness, split second of stupidity. When Wendy got to the pile which remained of Mary's body... She set the Banshee's head down to one side. She was an old creature from what Wendy could tell, 
a sense of power exuded from Mary, even dismembered as she was, and Wendy felt better. The old ones traveled alone. They knew better than to hunt in groups, too many people missing, and the local folk get concerned. It was best to snatch one or two. It made the Bobbin Sith harder to find. Unless you know what you're looking for, Wendy thought. She had been tracking Mary's movement for nearly a year. The Banshee had worked her way from upstate New York, down to the city, up into Connecticut, to the tip of Maine, and back down into New Hampshire. Almost a dozen dead. Runners, walkers, joggers. People who could conceivably go missing. Victims of unknown crimes. Wendy straightened up, took her can of lighter fluid out of her pack, and flipped it open. Something cried. A low whining. She stopped. A container poised above the remains. Wendy looked around and saw that the door to the office was ajar. Whatever it was cried again. And the sound came from the building. Oh, Jesus. Wendy thought, putting the lighter fluid down on the ground. Is there a kid in there? She pulled a fresh magazine out of the pack. Ejected the one in the pistol and replaced it quickly. She chambered around, took a firm grip on the weapon and advanced towards the structure. The cries increased in volume, each plaintive sound pulling at her. Wendy steeled herself against the possibility of a bitten child. In all of her years hunting the undead, she had only had to put down one young boy. She still had nightmares about it. Wendy took a deep breath. Gently climbed up the stairs and pushed the door fully open with her left hand. Her flashlight flickered and cast strange shadows around the room. She smelled earth and death, age and sorrow. The room was barren of furniture, but in the corner was a pile of blankets, and from the worn fabric she saw a small face peering at her. A little girl, dark-haired and with exceptionally white skin. Wendy lowered the pistols slightly, and then she saw the girl's eyes. Pale, exactly like Mary's. As Wendy went to bring the weapon back up, the girl hissed. The vicious, needle-shaped teeth of a bovin Sith glared from her mouth. Sharp gray nails extended from the tips of the girl's fingers. Before Wendy could pull the trigger, something slammed into her and she shot wildly into the ceiling. Wendy was sent spinning into the far wall. The girl launched herself out of the blankets and a smaller child scrambled over Wendy. The disturbing clack of miniature hooves on the worn floorboards rang out. A harsh reminder of the lost humanity of the turned children. The gun was quickly ripped from Wendy's hand and thrown across the room. Long fingernails latched onto her wrist punching deep into her flesh and penetrating her veins. Even as she struggled to shake the child off, the girl landed on Wendy's chest. Her sternum cracked and ribs shattered. She jerked Wendy's head back, drove her long nails into Wendy's throat. Wendy winced as dry lips attached themselves to the wounds of her throat, and the young banshee began to drink. The instant loss of blood sapped Wendy of her strength, her efforts to free herself becoming no more potent than a fish flopping in the bottom of a canoe. The thrum of her own blood in her ears sank to a dull murmur. Her heartbeat slowed. Slowly, her consciousness faded, and Wendy was left with one terrible thought. Dear God, they're not going to kill me.